six o'clock. Thanks everyone for showing up. And I guess others will be along in a minute. You snooze, you lose. So we're going to get started. So here you can see the Internet Chess Club homepage. They talk about recent videos. Uh, Grandmaster Miguel Elascasas, top 10 check Server patterns. announcement. We also have our server announcements. You can see announcement about our Hen Chess videos on Twitch and so forth. You can see Grandmaster Yarmolinsky teaches you openings, the Botvinnik Slav. Now, one thing people don't really know about Yermo is that he grew up uh, in the same town where uh, Kasparov grew up as a young boy. And in their youth tournaments, he actually beat Kasparov not once but twice. And I think Yermo's also won a couple of uh, U.S. championships. And of course, my favorite series is What Every Russian Schoolboy Should Know. But serious player, also big fan of uh, Akiba Rubinstein. Okay, so a few other events. You can see the uh, 51st National Open Chess Congress uh, was added. And you can see a list of other different events and so forth. Okay, so what are we going to do today? Today, one of the things you can do on ICC is you can go to your library, okay? Here, you have your profile, then you have your games. There, you have your most recent games, and I believe it'll cover probably your last 20 games or so. Then you can also have what's called a game library. So if you really like particular games, you can save them to your library. And I believe the library holds up to 400 games, okay? Now, for today's program, we're going to look at two more games in the Norwegian Rat, and then we'll go ahead and play all challengers, okay? Aha, Nicholas, you're remote. Yes, about 30% of my class is remote. Uh, Nicholas, yes, but uh, give it about 10 or 15 minutes. I'm going to go over two games first, and then I'll be open to challenges, okay? So look forward to playing you. Okay, so the first game we're going to click on here okay is a game sailor was black and he's playing river tail and i'm not sure but i think it was about a 5-0 time control so let's just take a quick look e4 now one good point there is that with this opening you can actually start and play it with black against either d4 or e4 usually you get to it from e4 g6 but as we can see in this game they got the same position from this move order. Now, of course, it's very provocative. It's a bit like a hybrid between the Alyekin defense and the modern defense. A lot of players don't want to accept the challenge of playing e5 and playing into the gambit, and so they play knight c3. Very solid alternative. In fact, Mr. McKnight played that against me, I believe. Okay. Let's see, Mr. McKnight is saying there's a complete list of, quote, my games in the menus. Server as well. announcement. Okay and holds all the games you played on ICC. So yeah, that's very good to know, okay? And he also says each game is saved in a file on your system. As long as the file is there and not deleted, it'll save all the games. Oh, and one other point there is I actually get emails. I think you can set it up so you can get automated emails every time you finish a game, okay? That way when you lose a game and you finally got over it, then you get an email a reminder about how bad you played, <laughs> okay? Anyway, what differentiates this is, of course, you could play d6, and then you have a normal Pierce, you know, defense-type setup, but d5, and then on e5, knight to e4. And this gives it an independent Norwegian rat characteristic. So, many ways to play. One of the more challenging is to go ahead and capture the knight and call black's buff, bluff. Pawn takes, and now one of the more aggressive systems is bishop to c4. You can see the bishop strikes at the f7 pawn. Very, very aggressive play. So today we're going to look at two games that uh, Mr. Saylor had recently, uh, you know, within the last month or two, in this particular variation. Well, of course, you develop. And now f4. Now, that's more aggressive and interesting in some ways. A lot of players will play like knight e2 or c3, reinforce their center, knight e2 to try and come to g3 and round up the pawn. Now, f4 here, Sailor did what I thought was correct. He went ahead and took the pawn because now he doesn't have to worry about it. But the computer seemed to like white after knight takes f3. Now, if you go back, instead of e takes f3, 
Uh, the computers are saying something about F, bishop f5, uh, something about equality. It's very unclear. White has a pretty potentially massive center. But anyway, in the game, after e f3, knight takes f3. Yeah, white's got a little lead in development, potential pressure on f7. But let's see how San, uh, Sailor handled the case. He castled, protecting that f7 pawn. Now bishop to g5. Pawn to c5. This is very thematic. And play now really takes on the characteristics of like a Gruenfeld exchange variation, but the old classical variation. So now d5. Maybe c3 would have been a little more circumspect. But now b5, taking advantage of the fact that there's no knight to come to c3, so the bishop cannot take the pawn because queen to a5 check. So that means the bishop has to back it up. But now bishop to b7. Now here, white played c4, reinforcing the pawn. But if white plays a move like pawn to d6, play gets extremely sharp, okay? Black seems to be more or less okay. But after c4, knight d7. Again, d6 is on the table, but sometimes you could even play rook over and sack that exchange, collect a pawn, claim that you have some pretty nice bishops on a pretty open board. Pretty decent comp. Bishop f4. Black backs up. But now, after the white bishop backs up to protect the e5 pawn, Black continues his undermining operation. After queen d2, knight to b6. You can see now the pawn on d5 is pretty weak. Okay. Pawn to d6. Takes, takes, and rook e8. So you can see Black has managed to achieve some very nice active play. After castles, queen f6. I think when I looked at it, the queen f6 was not necessarily needed, but it's not bad. Queen f6 attacks the bishop on f4, two hits on the pawn on b2. Normally, you wouldn't be that thrilled about capturing the pawn on b2, but in this scenario where you get double c pawns, both of those puppies suddenly become passed. The one pawn might go to c3. So, d7. It's game on. Now here, Sailor played rook d8, okay, I think. But it turns out that knight takes d7, queen takes d7, rook takes, no, not rook takes e2, queen takes f4. And then on queen takes b7, then you have rook b8 connecting the dots, followed by rook takes e2 with a crushing game for black. But, of course, we're all so smart after the fact when we check things with our computer. So now bishop g5. Queen takes. Here white plays a very practical move. Queen to f4, sacrificing a pawn to try and maintain some initiative. Server announcement. Okay. But now c3. Probably c3 is not the right way to handle the position for black. He needs to play something like maybe rook f8, get a little more juice uh, to protect himself. Also, I think knight d5. Yeah, I think one computer mentioned knight d5. Bust that queen out of there on queen g4. Uh, then you just move the rook to c7. And then black's problems are pretty much cleared up. But instead, c3, by this time, both players were a bit short on time. Fairly fast time control, knight into e5. Yes, and that exploits the pawn being on c3. Anyway, rook to f8, sacking the exchange. Takes, takes, and rook f2. But then came pawn to c2, bishop into e7. Now you can see if the rook moves, queen takes f7, check is on the table. But straight ahead, bishop takes, king takes. So, you have this strange material assortment here, but now after queen e3, losing a critical tempo, but attacking the pawn on c5 with check, then came very good move queen to d4. Now, depending on where the queen goes, black only needs one move to play bishop h6 and support the pawn. Here, after the exchange of queens, pawn takes and back, and pawn to d3, I believe at this point, white resigned. And in fact, Black's advantage here is about four points. The pawns are absolute monsters at this point. 
And it's not even so easy just to say, okay, look, I'll give up a piece because after bishop takes, knight takes, forks two more rooks. So by no means a perfect game, but new territory. After bishop g7, this move f4 has not been seen a lot, but after takes, takes, castles, and c5, blackhead, pretty decent counterplay. So now the next game that I would show, so you can see we've got six games in our library, the other four games we've covered in previous sessions. And now the last game we're going to look at is against uh, Sailors Plain Black against Mr. Braska. Flip the board around so we get the proper perspective. And again, when I saw first saw Magnus Carlsen playing this opening, I thought, oh, what garbage, what nonsense. He's just being cute. You know, he's just being provocative. But in reality, he's been winning a lot of games with it. Now, of course, this is the more normal move order, e4, g6. And so again, we see knight c3. Now comes d5, e4, e5, and then knight to e4. Trade, trade, and again, bishop to c4. Yeah, a very appealing and very aggressive looking system for white. Well, c5 right away, which probably is a touch premature. Probably better to go ahead and play bishop g7 first, and then play c5 and go after the center. So let's see. In this game, after c5, c3, but then knight c6. Now, very much like the Gruenfeld, this game really does take on the characteristics of the old-fashioned knight e2 Smyslov variation of the Gruenfeld. As you see, black's piece placement and white's piece placement is very similar. In the old exchange variation of the Gruenfeld, we're talking like what was played in the 60s and 70s in the time of Spassky and Fischer. In fact, they even had a game in Santa Monica, I think ultimately ended in a draw, I think. Anyway, uh, white would have the knight on e2 and the bishop on c4, the theory being that they kind of avoided the pin. Now, of course, there's no black pawn up here on e4. But nonetheless, black's play is very similar to the old Smyslov variation. Notice any time if they take on, on c5, you have knight takes e5. And now queen c7. This is, again, borrowed from the old Smyslov variation. Now here the opponent plays something different. Magnus had a game, if you go back, where his opponent castled, and he played rook d8, and he made the comment about it might seem a little bit strange to leave the f7 pawn tender, but on the other hand, he felt that his play against the e5 pawn justified playing like that. So in this case, the opponent plays bishop d5, well, of course, that just invites rook d8, which we wanted to play anyway. And when he takes, here's the critical point. Knight takes e5, knocks out the head of the white pawn chain, and black's actually already doing quite reasonably well. Now, of course, if white were to castle here, well, then a move like knight c4 is possible, knocking out the dark squared bishop, or knight to g4, threatening mate, and then on bishop f4, you get the usual tactics associated with that. Well, in the game, white went for the pin. So it's pin city here. The rook is pinning the d-pawn to the white queen, but this bishop is now pinning the black knight to the black queen. So of course, time to step aside. Now, if white just castles, well, black probably gets a very comfortable game with simply pawn takes pawn, and then maybe knight to c4, or even knight to c6. So white went all in with pawn takes pawn. So now comes a very forced sequence that liquidates a lot of material. Rook takes, pawn takes, rook takes, pawn takes. But now a very nice move. A lot of players would automatically play rook takes the pawn on a7, and then white might play rook to the d-file and try and sneak in on the back rank. But I think here Sailor played bishop f5, looking to trade the light squared bishops. So what is the point? Well, after trades and trades, now the d3 square is a bit vulnerable, and on rook to d1, he could play rook takes the pawn on a2, and then collect the guy on a7. So in the game, bishop takes, bishop takes, knight to d4. 
Now what to do? The pawn on f5 is under attack, so you either have to give up your bishop or defend it. So first things first, rook takes. Now of course, knight takes f5, you have bishop takes c3 check is very convenient. So white castle kingside, and then bishop takes, pawn takes, and now you have a double rook ending. Well, how apropos. Uh, about three or four years ago, I did a series of 13 rook end game videos for ICC, and I think they're about, the first two cover basically all the tactics that you need in rook endings. So there's probably about 20, 21 tactics, you know, like double attack, domination, mating net. And then after that, it's practical examples. But one thing that I learned in doing those videos is two big differences in double rook end games versus single rook end games. First off, double rook end games, you have a bigger capacity to try and create mating nets, okay? Which makes sense. You've got almost double the amount of firepower. And then secondly, double rook end games give the winning side some opportunities, and the losing side also, to try and exchange into favorable single rook end games, okay, that are more clearly defined. So basically, double rook end games still have a little more play in them, if you will. And one of the things I like to have my students is make notations in their own games. I do it in my games. Every time I reach certain type of end games, I make a note. This is a bishop and two rook end game against knight and two rooks or whatever. Now, in this case, of course, we just have a double rook end game and black to play first. So he goes after the d-pawn. Now notice that rook at f to d1 fails to a typical back rank mate motif with rook takes a2, okay? Notice also that instead, if you just take the pawn on a2, it's not necessarily a, a winning uh, rook in game because he can play rook over to b1. He might be able to play rook back and then rook to b8 in time, but it's still not that easy. So I like what he did here. He played rook to d2. Well, white let that pawn go and played g3 to create luft, and then rook takes. Okay, so now he has a basic 4 to 3 advantage, but he's threatening rook to c7. So in a way, what white did was pretty reasonable. He sacrificed a pawn, which is very important to gain activity. So now b6, trying to hold on to that guy. Rook over. He let that guy go, but you get rooks doubled on the 7th. Rook kind of has to go to f1 with or without the check. King steps up. And now, very important. You'll see this when you watch Magnus Carlsen play Blitz, where he'll get this kind of endgame, and he's really great at pressing. So white does the standard thing that you're supposed to do in rook endgames, which is to play the pawn up to h4. But in general, that's especially important when black has a g-pawn, because you don't want black playing moves like g5 and g4 and boxing in your king and weaving mating nets. Here... I'm not sure that h5 is so useful. But anyhow, pawn to e4. So now we can see the threat is simply pawn to e3. So this forces black on the defensive. Okay. And now the king comes forward. Rook to e3, trying to prevent any kind of pawn to e3 again. And you can see the white, the black king is coming in. So yeah, we notice that he can't play king h3 without dropping the f2 pawn. So, after king g1, king g4, believe it or not, computers consider that black is almost winning here. Because it's very hard for uh, him to get untied, as we'll see. He goes king up, but now a little quiet move, rook e2. And again, going back to what we said about double rook in games, they give you the opportunity for mating nets, and the opportunity to exchange into favorable winning single rook endgames. White has a dilemma here. If he moves his rook away, black's ready to play pawn to e3 maybe. Although even then that might not be so easy because he might be able to play rook check and then rook to f4 and try and save himself. But in the game, he traded. But now what to do? It's a semi zigzwang you're threatening e3. If his king goes to the back rank, then you move in with your king to f3, and he's just getting squeezed, even though there's a pair of rooks on the board. So what happened in the game? He played h5. Desperation. 
Now, of course, you could run back and take it, but then he would go rook check. Instead, stick to the program, pawn to e3. Well, of course, once you have a single rook in game, one of the things you look to do is liquidate down to a winning pawn in game. Okay, so after pawn to h6, well, now it's easy peasy. Check. You just trade, 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 and pawn to f4. You're going to trade those pawns, and then you're going to go pluck that pawn, and with two extra pawns, pretty easy pickings. Anyway, back to the opening. Just take a quick look after bishop c4. A little early with the c5. c3, knight c6, knight e2, bishop g7. Pretty standard looking position. And then black's play with queen c7. The idea is to play rook d8, keep putting pressure on the d-pawn, and keep white busy so he doesn't have time to just play knight g3 and round up the pawn on e4. Anyway, another very dynamic example of why this Norwegian rat is just not quite so easy to snuff out. Very useful to know. You can toggle your accepting challenges back and forth. And so it now says we're open and accepting match request. So if Mr. McKnight or Nicholas wants to give us a 3-0 or a 5-0, or big boy, hallelujah! Welcome to the broadcast, buddy. Yeah, you can probably see the previous videos uh, on Incoming YouTube. challenge. Oh, Mr. Venom is back. Okay. Boy, game we had a, started. Had a game with him last time, but this time we got black. Haven't done this in a while, so... I know, probably should have played the Norwegian Rat to be consistent, but... Oh boy, do we play aggressive or... Nah, why not play this more solid? That said, he goes here, and what is this Max Lang is very dangerous these days, right? So what's the story with this gambit, though, if you go bishop d5? I'm not sure that's really the right approach, but I see. He's not going to make it so easy for us. Now he's ready to just give us the boot. Mm -hmm. This is what happens when you play openings you don't really know so well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this knight's going to be a pain to deal with.
This does not look good. Oh, and we're short on time. Time warning. Check. 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 Black forfeits on time. Okay, good game, sir. Old variation that I don't really remember so well from my youth. Anyway, very well done. And not a great start. Oh, that was Nicholas. Oh, okay, Nicholas. I didn't know that was you. Okay, so Nicholas is Venom. In that case... Let's do a rematch. Anyway, good game, Nicholas. I didn't know how to deal with the pressure on F6. Game started. Okay, so we got a rematch. Thank you, sir. Mm-hmm. I don't know, years ago Yasser used to play something like this. Not totally sure about it. Am I supposed to play H4 and hold on to the knight?
So he's managed to figure out how to get around there and challenge my knight. Okay. Don't really want to take that. Ah, here's the problem now. I can't take both his knights. Hmm. Yeah, I'm wondering if I missed something there. I may have missed a G4 prying him away from that F6 rook at one moment. Time warning. Check. Black forfeits on time. Well, that was lucky. Extremely close game. Good game, sir. Incoming challenge. Okay, I think we're going to let some other people play, but still a good night for you, for both of us. Uh, but thank you so much. Tough games. Okay, so, yeah, I thought about e5, and I also, uh, yeah, years ago, Yasser B. Thins points out that knight h3 is kind of an offbeat line against Leningrad Dutch. I thought black's supposed to play like a e6 and e5. And then there's some long variation Yasser had years ago where black tries to play g5, and Yasser had some variation where he sacks the knight for a bunch of pawns. What? That's a long time ago. I barely remember the article, let alone what you're supposed to do. Incoming challenge. Let's see. McKnight's. Okay. Game started. Oh, I always have tough games with this guy. I forget what happened last time. The Scandinavian is actually pretty popular among, uh, you know, like Magnus. Nakamura's played it a few times. And uh, you know, Nakamura, though, plays some funny variation where he takes on d5 and runs back home. Not supposed to be all that good, but, you know, not bad. Yeah, e3 is a weird move. Probably a waste of time. Computers probably hate it. But it does keep his guys off of b4. And I thought maybe to pop out here. Although, why don't we go here? Threatening to give him trouble pawns. Although, oh, he's not worried about such things. 
Okay. I probably put too much stock in them myself. A little inconsistent on me to play a3 and then to play bishop b5 instead of bishop c4. I mean, boy, that bishop would be a beauty on c4 now, wouldn't he? But done is done. Lock it up, baby. Okay, we're out of here. Time to castle. We are out of here. Okay, let's pin him like uh, like uh, Nicholas did to me. Oh, dude, can you play this in game? I guess. I guess you can do that, but I don't know. I mean, I guess you can do that. Just doesn't seem like it should be very pleasant, but of course, I still got to figure out what to do. And like I said before, I tend to overrate these kind of static advantages, if you will. Well, what to do? What to do to do to do 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 Wow, he's all uh he's all barreled up over there. Okay. I'll create some possibilities. Okay. Think. Now this, I thought, offered some prospects. Something about rooks on open files.
there, we're going to just play for the past pawn. Go for the delayed gratification business. Hmm. And now at least we don't have to worry about his uh, rook coming to the c file. So I was worried about some counterplay with rook c8 to c3 getting on my guys. But now this feels pretty, uh, pretty okay. Thought he should have gone rookie seven. Oh, but rookie seven. Go, little guy. Get up there. Get up there, buddy. You gotta gotta help your teammate. Yeah, it feels like we got it under control. <sighs> Doo -doo. And that should be a score. Black resigns. Okay, good game, sir. Uh, tricky. In game there with two rooks and knight versus two rooks and bishop. Give me one second. A little cup of coffee here. Anyway, Mr. McKnight's has his own streaming show. Definitely check it out if you want. Get in a game or two. He's a guy that just loves to play chess, working on his game, lives in uh, northern Florida. And uh, uh, so what is it? It's uh, twitch.tv backslash McKnight's. So sometime late at night, you feel like trying to get a game, he's, uh, he's usually around in the evening. Uh, Mr. B. Thins, you feel up to a game? Yeah, there you go, McKnight's. Twitch.tv backslash McKnight's. As opposed to... Okay. So yeah, interesting two rook in game. Uh, but I, I thought once I played rook c7, of course, I had, you know, some pretty serious initiative going. Like, after I took, took, and took here. But back when I played b4, and he played rook b8, this is good, and I played c takes d4, this is, without a doubt, the kind of critical moment. Maybe you need to play c takes b4. And then I was thinking that I could play knight takes on d6, Pawn takes on d6. And then I was wondering if I could take the pawn on e5. Incoming and challenge. So Mr. B thins. Okay, 5-2 game. Okay. Game started. It's a little slower. Trying to think what we haven't discussed. Uh, Rook h8 was a mouse slip. Oh, okay. He meant to go back to h8. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, this past week, actually, I was, uh, not like a week ago. Yeah, we were going over uh, Boris Spassky, of course, was the world champion that ultimately lost to Bobby Fischer. And uh, in the USSR versus the world match, Spassky played uh, black and Larson was his opponent. 
In fact, very interesting about that particular match is they were organizing it, and they approached Bobby, and they said, look, we're going to do this USSR versus the world match. Uh, we'd like you to play. And uh, But they were a little nervous because they'd already promised uh, Ben Larson board one. And of course, you know, Larson, Fisher, all these guys had, you know, not small egos, to put it nicely. <laughs> and so they were really afraid that uh, when they approached Fisher that he would not accept because he'd want to play board one. To their surprise, Fisher was like, uh, one Russian GM is the same as another, doesn't make a difference to me, and he wound up playing Petrosian, and of course, he crushed Petrosian. But meanwhile, on board one, Spassky played one of the most brilliant games ever when Larson played B3 and didn't really have all the nuances worked out at that time. And Spassky just absolutely crushed him in about 20 moves with this brilliant, you know, H takes G3, Rook to G1, he got double pawns. Just absolutely fantastic game if you ever get a chance to see it. Meanwhile, back here at the Hacienda, maybe a little less talking and a few more moves, if we could find some, would be in order. So what we have here actually is kind of a Nimzo Indian reversed, where obviously I've given up the bishop here. He's got the double pawns. A little bit of a question of how to proceed for, uh, for both sides here. Not an easy question to be sure. You see, he's putting more pressure on my guy there. Part of me wants to get the rook over. I don't know. I just feel like this rook should go over here, but then later I might run afoul of some c4. And part of me wants to just go over here. Oh, no. No, no, no. My last move might not have been quite as innocent as it seemed. Doesn't seem fair. Black centralized all his pieces, seemed to be doing everything more or less okay. Although, that said, the bishop on d7 was not something to be proud of. And then this happens. Yeah, I guess queen g3 was a little sneaky. Yeah, I thought he might do that. And then I had a, uh, a very funny idea. I thought I would go here check. Check. Oh boy. It's painful. Oh well, I'm not gonna take that rook. I want to. Part of me wants to. Part of me does not want to take that rook. Black resigns. Yeah, that bishop on d7, Bob, was not... Uh, that, that, was, that was the culprit. They also, putting the bishop on d7 took away the square your knight needed to go to to contest me for control of the e5 square. Now, interesting to note, that Fisher talked about uh, 
you know, he didn't use psychology, this and that. He believed in strong moves. But yet, twice in his life, when he did not play the uh, Sicilian and he played the Ayekin, besides the match, of course, with Spassky in 72, but also when Bobby had e4, he actually played b3 on two occasions. And one was actually against Enrique Mekin in the inner zone one year. And uh, my opinion was that players like Mekin and Brown were tremendous theoreticians in Bobby's own favorite uh, Sicilian Nydorf. And so uh, what uh, Bobby did was he played 1b3. And of course, Nydorf, I mean, uh, Mekin mishandled the black position and basically just got thematically destroyed in about 35 moves with something not totally dissimilar to this, where Bobby got the nice bishop, the nice knight on e5, and brought his queen out and attacked the king side. So anyway, Bob, uh, thank you for the game. Good game. Uh, yeah, the bishop on d7 kind of gummed up your works there, buddy. Yeah, haven't looked at b3 for a while. Yeah, I, I agree. It's kind of low on everyone's priority list, that and b4, right? But you can see where the bishop on d3 kept your knight from f6 from coming back there to contest the e5 square. Because, yeah, if you just let me uh, sink that knight in there on e5, roll my queen around, the other knight was going to come to f3 to g5. It's, uh, it's really the kind of play that you would like to have with white, that you would be very, very good at with white. So, yeah, sometimes against these young players like b-thins, you got to go old school on them. So, now... Just take a look back. You'll see I have an ICC logo. Thank you, Handsome Bill, who uh, this summer celebrated his 75th birthday. Now, would you care for a game or be thins? Would you like to uh, go for another game? And this time you should get white. Or we could just go fishing. Now, by the, by the way, uh, big boy, uh, what part of Norway? I actually went somewhere around the summer of 76. Dovery Mountain. Not so familiar, but uh, about 12 of us U.S. promising U.S. juniors at the time. I'm talking Mark Deason, Michael Rode, uh, Tisdall. Kenny Regan, myself, uh, I don't know if Yasser was with us, I don't remember. Peter Tamburo was one of our chaperones, and Jeff Kastner. And we actually took a trip through, uh, like, Sweden and Norway, and I think we went to Sandiford, Sandiford, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. And uh, anyway, let's throw out a five-minute challenge. If uh, B. Thins or McKnight's wants to play another game, otherwise I'm going to throw a challenge out there. Hmm. Incoming challenge. Okay. Let's see. Game started. Yep, that's fair. I had white last game, so he should get white. Okay, E5 didn't work out so well last game, but let's try it again. Got to do better. Okay. Okay, four knights, obviously... There's a reason it's called the Four Knights. Ah, but this variation. Yeah, I never was crazy about this variation. I think we're supposed to do something like d5. Server announcement. Server announcement. I'm not totally Sold on that.
Mm-hmm. This is all very uncertain for me. Yeah. I remember my friend Bernard Zuckerman said, uh, contrary to belief, experience is not the best teacher. And his point was, why to gain experience learning something when you can just read a book, right? Of course, in those Check. days, they had books, right? But one day, I really should learn these things. But for the moment... I feel like I'm doing okay, sort of, but it's not totally clear. Well, let's go to the party and try not to spend all time. I'm sorry, I thought she had to take that with the queen. Checkmate. Check, sir. Yeah, I think you had to take with the queen, and then I take with the bishop, and then you go bishop e1, and then I gotta have the queen on e3, then you can play something like bishop f2, but then I guess I could take on f4, and if you take on c5, I can go queen h3. That's what I was trying to reconnoiter, figure. Or, when I get my queen to e3, you can just play h takes g4, and then I really have to do a little gymnastics to get my queen out of dodge. I was thinking bishop f8, so that I can uh, meet bishop f2 with queen takes f4. But anyway, yeah, somehow, uh, I think e5 might be the culprit here. I'm not sure. I, I know there's some funny pawn sack with e5 in this line, but it's supposed to be borderline suspect. Server anyway, thank you for the game, sir. Uh, yeah, now the other thing you can do, of course, on d5 is just play pawn takes pawn, but that might come with a caveat that rook e8 check could be annoying. So not really sure about the exact move order, how I got so far developed here. Anywho, McKnight's, did you want to do one more game? Or Mr. B. Thins, you're due for white one game. Okay, 704. Oh, you're good. You're tired. Okay, so again, thank you, Mr. McKnight's, for dropping in. And again, that's uh, twitch.tv backslash McKnight's. Okay, and uh, maybe we'll get one more game with B. Thins, but now the colors might not rotate for him, but we'll see what happens. Yeah, uh, Mr. B. Thins, go ahead and send a challenge if you would. Incoming challenge. Okay. Now, even if Game I get white... Okay. started. So, that's fair. You, you got white pieces this time. Now, by the way, th this is obviously 5-2. How do we avoid the Jubava? The, the death-opening Jubava. And he knows that. What can I really play against this guy? Well, let's pretend we don't know what we're doing and just play our normal stuff. For better or for worse.
Night B5 is not on yet. <laughs> uh, if I take this pawn, Knight B5 is on, but I thought you were supposed to play E3 there. Now that said, this could get pretty tricky wiki. If I go for the uh, crudite E5 pawn sack, Hmm. That's some nasty stuff there, dude. <sighs> okay. Okay, when in doubt, get out of town. Hmm. I was actually concerned about knight c6, knight of d to b5, then when I go d6, which usually shuts that off, then knight to d5 looked extremely annoying. I got bagged once like that in a closed Sicilian. Okay, so now we're back kind of tamer looking business. I think I feel comfortable to challenge his knight. I can meet knight d5 with d6 if he wants to kamikaze a piece on d6. Can't stop him from doing it. But at least I don't have to worry about knight d5, b5, and then knight d5, the, 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 the double, double whammy. Why, why is it I feel if I castle that he may push Harry up the board? Is he that kind of guy? Let's just go here. A little more modest thought. Yeah, you got to watch out for these Joe Baba guys. They need no encouragement whatsoever to push that h-pawn up the board. Which is actually kind of a phenomenon from computers these days in more and more positions. Bam! h4, g4. Okay, now what's going on? Server announcement. Well, I'm going to chill. Interesting. Poop, poop, poop. Wow. So, it's like that. Now, let's just make sure he doesn't have some knight takes c6, queen take, bishop takes, and queen c3 hitting my unprotected rook and bishop on c6. That's how Magnus lost to, uh, who was the 18-year-old kid he lost to? Had that combination. That was very unusual. Like, But of course, the white pawn was on e4, and the black bishop was on e7 or something.
Okay, so we're still debating what to do here. Now, of course, am I too loose to play knight takes? But then when I do, he'll play pawn takes, and that opens up for his bishop to come firing in. I'm not sure I'm liking that scenario. So let's just continue to chill. Now, I guess rook c8, followed by trying to snake the knight into c4, would be another way to go. But here I was contemplating whether I can play for the b4 push, which may or may not be a thousand percent correct. Oh, there he goes. Wow. And then there's always the question. Ah, let's just try and stop him. I don't know if I'm really... I was just thinking anyway, I don't know if I'm really ready to play uh, knight to play up there. Okay, he's got some e5 action coming, no question about that. If I go there, am I getting in trouble? Mm-hmm. Yep, he's he's coming. <laughs> yep, this is looking more and more dangerous, sir. Oh wow. If I go running out there. Oh, why not? because it's ridiculously risky. That's why not. Not totally sold that my queen should be there. Why didn't I put my queen on... Uh... And then I guess he's got that. Oof, oof. Uh huh. Uh huh. I can't blame him. Can't blame him at all. Something about the old tit-for-tat. Xanatoli used to say, don't be afraid. But of course, that was Anatoly. I hope my stuff's holding together here. Hmm. Now that's disappointing. The move I wanted to play is not so good. It's not so bad. And the good news is he's, uh, oh, okay, I see. I see the light. More or less. Check. White forfeits on time. Now here I was thinking, whether it's correct or not, that on queen takes 
and rook take and knight takes and rook d6 that I would have rook d8 and I was thinking that the pin would set me free and let me hold on to the extra piece anyway good game mr mr thins yeah uh okay big boy's got to kick it in i totally understand that right b thins right uh epicinco was a young 18 year old first time that magnus has lost to a uh a teenager well magnus is getting a little long in the tooth he's 30 plus now right <laughs> So anyway, Mr. B. Thins, thanks for the game. Definitely, uh, yeah, better effort and uh, hard fight. Uh, I think in the final position, yeah, I'm doing okay. I'm surviving the wave, but it was not so easy before that, okay, to say the least. I mean, long in here, I don't know how to evaluate the position. Seems pretty unclear. Black seems pretty solid, but white has prospects with either e4 or g4. It's a tough game on the horizon. I mean, maybe instead of rook b8, maybe I should have been playing knight a5 and rook c8 and trying to swing into c4, at least try to get, get you to cough up a bishop pair. Not sure. Because once I got here, I didn't really want to play b4 in too big a rush. Yeah, b thins thinks that maybe g4 was not the best, best move. Okay, let's throw out a five-minute game challenge. See if there's anyone out there to play. Probably get some tank. And probably would do one, maybe two more games, and we will call it a night. I'm not actually at my home location tonight, so got a little bit of a drive ahead of me. Which normally wouldn't be such a big deal, but now in Florida we have all these visitors from out of town. Up north, called snowbirds. With a wide variety of driving skills, as you may imagine. Okay, so if we don't have a game, what could we do? We could always practice and improve. And I wonder if we can enter examination mode for this particular game. Game started. Ah, oh, I got white this game. Okay, what to do? Okay, e4. What's he got? What does he do? Uh, Sicilian guy. Okay. Mm hmm Yeah. Good point. Okay, what the heck. Play what we know. Let's do something different. Let's play this.
Yeah, Ron, uh, this really looks how you like like how you play for advantage with the white pieces, dude. Yep, that's consistent to be sure. Ah, now what do we take? Yeah, I was wondering if he was going to challenge my, my guy. Oh, boy. Oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. It's not easy. Mm-hmm. Interest fascinating. Okay. Let's not spend all day on this. A decision would be nice. Well, ah, why not go for it? Because it's not good. Well, we'll see. We will see.
Am I going to regret this and get mated on the light squares? Yep, he's up there. This is not recommended that you play like this at home. Well, Fabiano did something like this against uh, Wojtovic, where he gave up his bishop for the knight on c3. Yes, he's in there trying to checkmate me. Well, what is it I have to do? Is it queen f3 or pawn f3? Well, the program was to play pawn f3 and pray. That was the plan. That was the plan. Oh, Lord, help me. He wants to do bad things to me. As a friend of my childhood used to say, I don't want any more cheese. I just want out of the trap. That might be the wrong rook annotation. Okay, so now I think we're okay. Didn't really think that out so well. I just knew that I wanted to. <sighs> Black forfeits on time. Well, a good game up until Bishop takes Rook on uh, B8 there, buddy. Uh, sorry about that. Yeah. Anyway, very, very tough game. Tough game. Uh, I think you're right to challenge my knight on uh, B6 there with knight B6. And, you know, and then look, it was just game on from there. Okay, so I thank everyone for showing up, everyone that participated, and thank ICC, thank Sandro for staying up late, and so forth, and we will see you guys next Thursday.